hello and welcome back and let's get nostalgic let's get retro let's look at some old tech what i'm going to be doing as you may already know from my other videos i don't know what order they're going to go out in i'm going to be looking at old tech around the new tech as well because although i talk about brand new nasdaq thunderbolt storage and more it's always good to see how these brands have evolved over the years so between all my other projects i am going to be looking at some old tech as well just to see where these brands actually started and we can see the evolution of the hardware and the software now this is from synology it, it comes back all the way from 2010 and it was known as the usb station 2 that's right what a cool name guys but it was actually pretty groundbreaking for the time this is although there had been nas prior to this point and after this point this was an um, this was merging different concepts at the time in storage you had your network attached storage devices being released from synology and others that were large storage devices that had hard drives inside that allowed you to connect them over the network or the internet to a bespoke user interface and software environment which is great but at the same time you had a bunch of these clunky little boxes with usb boxes that you connected external flash sticks or external hard drives to that you had backed up of all your tv shows and your episodes of lost my god that turned out well didn't it um connecting those in and made those drives network accessible so there were lots of ways in which people were utilizing old tech and new tech and old storage and new storage together and this was a kind of sideline at the time from synology the usb station 2 that's right they said they wouldn't do it again now it retailed for about a hundred quid which even at the time from what the reviews i've read around was actually a little high for what you were getting. But even now, looking back on it, there was a lot of the Synology swish, a lot of the branding, and ultimately a lot of the brand confidence kept something like this going. Now, it wasn't just a brainless box that you connected external drives to. It arrived with support of DSM, Disk Station Manager. At that time, DSM 3.2. So DSM 3.2 had already evolved a number of the key features of functionality and, dare I say, design that we saw in later variations of DSM, all the way up to currently DSM 6.2, with DSM 7 hopefully in beta soon. Now, the hardware inside unsurprisingly for something with USB in the title, wasn't exactly breathtaking even for back then. It arrived with an 800 megahertz CPU, uh, and that CPU was also buffered by 128 megabytes of memory. And that's what you got inside this to run DSM. And I know I can hear a number of you that follow NAS thinking the same as me. 800 megahertz, 128 mega memory, that sounds a lot like that 2016 one the ds uh, 216 se and you're right so even at the time things hadn't evolved much they were synology was still a brand at that point that were very very focused on software not hardware and who can blame them because let's face it it's got them where they are today they you know they played it right um so before we go any further and talk about the software let's take a little look what we got inside this retail box it's very petite as you can see the usb station box to give you information about multimedia and accessing a printer over the network, which at that point was still pretty impressive, although today we kind of go, and. Um, on the rear, we've got information there about the layout, some topography there about devices you can connect to it over it. Even information about, you know, Boaster talking about Wi-Fi 3G. Um, so let's have a look inside. We have... Synology including a CD with software and I'll be honest I don't remember that ever happening but of course we are talking 2010 and this has got their cop this has got the USB station software inside and this is how you would install disk station manager and also some of the client apps too a DSM for the USB station 2 there were upgrades over time indeed if you go to Synology's own download pages you can find there were upgrades to DSM running on this device um Inside, you've got our quick start installation guide. A great deal more graphical than the books we get these days. Because let's face it, this is at a point when, although broadband was obviously around, and we were getting faster internet speeds, paper guides were still the best way to get imagery uh, out there for users in an easy hosting fashion. Lots of information there about setting it up for the first time, and how you connect things, and how you connect to it remotely, or via Windows, locally or otherwise. We've got warranty information, and the device arrived with two years of warranty, which staggeringly is not valid right now. Um, so I probably won't throw this against the wall. Um, we've got the unit itself, 
um, here, which I am going to talk about more towards the end um, of this video. Inside, we have an external power brick, and again, that is just a simple connector there that goes into the rear of the device. Inside as well, we have an Ethernet cable included as well. So we've got our RJ45 LAN cable. I'm just trying to read the cable to see what kind of cable we're dealing with here. This is a Cat5e cable, quite nice. Um, so that's um, RJ45, and that's all you get for your retail box there. So now we can talk about the unit itself. Now, because this did arrive with a version of DSM, and look how damn small that is, it's weirdly attractive, this device. I've got to say, I can see why it was appealing at the time. Um, the device itself, because it's got DSM inside, it supported a number of those key applications. Don't get me wrong, it, DSM at that point wasn't the behemoth we know now. It could install apps and you could download bits and bobs, and there were firmware updates, of course, but what you could do with network attached storage with regards to your client devices, uh, your PCs, your Macs, your mobiles at that point was quite limited. You obviously had file level access, which is always good. And of course, connecting an external drive because this had no internal storage meant that you could make multimedia files, movies, TV shows, music, photos, that sort of thing, network accessible to those connected devices on that DLNA media server. As you could see through the images on the box, it supported DLNA uh, printer server as well, which meant you could connect a printer to this device and therefore make that printer accessible to anyone on the local area network, even if it was like a dumb printer that was, you know, no, you didn't have network capability. Wi-Fi printers were in their infancy at that point. Now, Outside of that, there were a few more, well, for the time, bespoke applications like iTunes Server and Apple Time Machine support, which meant if you're a Mac user, it did open up a number of the closed doors of the Mac system, uh, you know, OS X at that point, which really restricted the devices you could communicate with. And that's not really a trend that's gone away, let's be honest. If you're a Mac user, you will often find invisible walls in the case of options just not being there open to you or Mac slowly closing doors around you so you stick to the proprietary means. Um, this helped you get around a number of those at the time. And I can't speak for how functional it is right now, but I will say that there was probably a lot of you out there that needed this kind of gateway key around those barriers. Um, on top of that, you had a download server as well built into it so you could arrange RSS downloads, um, FTP, HTTP, and of course there were torrents, and I believe even NZB was knocking around predominantly at that point. I know the world of downloading files over the internet in 2010, although it was easy, it was still a very murky world with regards to piracy, and I can't imagine a lot of you didn't take advantage of some of those features in the early days of a device like this. But let's take a look at the device. Let's take a look at the front there. We've got LEDs there denoting power, network access, and of course, USB access too. Unsurprisingly, this device does not support USB 3 at that point. That would have really pushed the budget up on this device. So you would have had to bear in mind that the drive you used would have been limited to USB 2 speeds, and the multimedia you watched may have been severely bottlenecked by your network or indeed the USB connection. The base of the device, has got hooks there for wall mounting it, which is quite impressive, something you don't see in a lot of Synology devices, and even a safe disconnect button, which again is solid Synology through and through. If we look at the rear of the device, we can see uh, an ethernet cable there, and the fact that it isn't wireless kind of surprises me, because it wasn't long after this that we saw the Synology Air series arrive, a wireless NASes, and a wireless version of this, I imagine, would have been quite impressive indeed. Um, on top of that, we have got those two USB ports for connecting different media. Now, if you would access this device, you would access it via your web browser, and you would use the file station application built into DSM. You were still accessing a kind of I think it would have been glorified to call it an operating system at that point, but you certainly would have said it was a graphical user interface with different apps that you could function and use at the same time. And that CPU was able to support you in 2010 in a way that it simply couldn't now. Um, with regards to the download to this, I'm hoping to do a software overview of this device just to give you guys some idea about just how DSM has changed from Synology over the years. But you've got to give it to them. In terms of design, even in 2010, this is a neat, looking device it's petite it feels robust it's got the cooling built into the top and it did have a 
One thing I have seen in the specifications which surprised me is it's got a noise level reported at 21 dBA. And I don't know what would generate that noise because there's passive cooling around the edges. On the top of the device, we have even more cooling. So that's a lot of cooling for a device if it has a fan inside. So I'm looking forward to turning this on just to see where exactly 21 um, dBA comes from in terms of noise, unless there's a giant active CPU fan in there. I'm just not seeing it. But <coughs> that has been the USB Station 2 from 20. 10. Do me let, let me know what you think. I will be doing loads of videos like this all the way through the year between other projects. Let's face it, it's kind of a passion project. I'll be amazed if this video hits um, the views in the three figures, but we'll see. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Do click like if you did, and do click subscribe to learn more about network attached storage, new and old, from all of the big brands. Otherwise, I will see you next time.